Just a big thank you to everyone for joining us for this sort of hour long workshop, um, focusing very much around the, the new skilling and retaining talent across Kent and Medway for our cultural, creative and digital future. Um, because of time and uh, we wanted to get the main gist of this session done, which is that discussion between those of us around the table. Um, I'm going to cut down my piece significantly, um, barring really just to introduce myself. So my role is uh, on behalf of the South East Local Enterprise Partnership. Um, I coordinate something called the Digital Skills Partnership um, that covers Kent uh, and Medway, Essex and East Sussex. Um, so I sort of corral and administer and support um, our co-chairs and our working group leads, many of whom will be very well known to delegates from Kent and Medway. Um, so people like Professor Melissa Hannah-Brown from Pfizer, Alison Palmer from the FSB here in Kent, who jointly co-chair our DSP. And we're one of seven such partnerships across the UK, supported by DCMS or the Department for Digital Culture, Media and Sport. Um, and we're made up of a range of private, voluntary and public sector colleagues, um, all working towards identified digital skills priorities in the region, which I'll, I'll try and talk about a bit later um, in the session today. But in terms of how we're going to flow, so basically I'll be joined, I'm delighted to be joined, should I say, by George Windsor from Tech Nation, Lizzie Hodgson um, from Regeneration 2031, who are going to give you their insight into the subject, um, and that will help further set that discussion up for a little later on. Joe and Caroline hopefully are going to lead us in the discussion part of the workshop after George and Lizzie's input. Um, and then we're going to come back together uh, towards the end to feedback and sum up. Um, so as per the main event, please make use of the chat, the messaging function here on Remo throughout to ask questions, share thoughts. And we've set aside some time for you to network amongst your virtual tables a little later on too. So um, without further ado, um, I'd like to invite George Windsor up on stage so George is Head of Insights for Tech Nation. Um, his role sees him supporting ambitious scaling entrepreneurs to accelerate their growth by monitoring, informing and championing, championing sorry, UK tech. And he's been responsible for a number of their reports and academic research coming out of Tech Nation. So um, without further ado, as I say, over to you, George. Great, thank you very much. I'm going to share my screen because uh, I've got a few slides to present to you this morning. So uh, thank you very much for the introduction. Um, what I'm going to be doing is giving you a picture of uh, the whole of the UK and then we'll get into a lot more detail uh, around sort of jobs and skills that have been emerging over the course of the last uh, five years, uh, particularly thinking about, I guess, some of the pervasive and very structural changes that have emerged over the course of the last year, uh, because I don't think it should be understated the impact that that has had on the labour market in the UK. Uh, and what that impact will continue to be, um, we uh, make some uh, sort of assertions um, and uh, it will be great to discuss it later uh, with you um, about both what that picture will look like uh, and then how we respond to that. Uh, what that means in terms of um, skills provision, thinking about skills supply and then marrying that up against the perspective on demand. So, as mentioned, and I'll just whip through this very, very quickly, um, as Tech Nation, um, we really exist in order to um, help uh, and support uh, scaling businesses um, to accelerate their growth. Um, so we're really about unlocking the growth potential of scaling leadership teams, delivering impact that lasts, collaborating, and uh, really informing uh, the ecosystem in order to uh, really hopefully sort of boost the prospects of scaling tech companies in the UK. A uh, bit of a shout out to Elizabeth, um, who's our entrepreneur engagement manager um, for the Southeast. Um, so if you have any questions, um, do get in touch with either myself or Elizabeth uh, after the event. Elizabeth is here today um, and, uh, and we can definitely talk uh, about how as Tech Nation, uh, we could potentially work with you in order to achieve many of those outcomes that we're talking talking about today. So to begin with, I'm going to give you a big picture um, and uh, I'm going to give you a sense of what's happened in the UK over the course of the last year. Um, and I think it's worth saying at the very outset that, of course, it's been an, an extremely challenging year. Um, and in presenting many of these stats, um, I'll, I'll ask you to take um, some of them with a pinch of salt and understand the fact that it has been a, a year that's been very, very challenging for many businesses right across the UK. Nevertheless, um, we saw in 2020 a record uh, amount of 
VC investment into UK tech, uh, just over $15 billion compared to that 14.8 billion figure for 2019. And of course that surprised many people, um, but actually in, you, in looking at some of the investments on the right hand side here, uh, we can see um, that there are organizations like Revolut, SNCC, Graphcore, Immunicore, um, that are really, uh, I guess, those sort of companies that evidence the transformation, the deep transformation of core um, functional areas of the UK economy, whether it's money, um, finance, banking, uh, whether it's thinking about cybersecurity and online uh, sort of safety, the protection of businesses, or thinking about health, um, we know uh, that there have been dramatic transformations in the way that the economy is structured over the course of the last year, and many of these investments reflect that fact. We've seen uh, investment rising across many uh, UK clusters too. Um, we've seen that particularly the case uh, in places like um, Oxford, as you can see, where investment has really rocketed uh, in the likes of Glasgow, Edinburgh, um, uh, they've seen strong continued investment um, and actually as you can see from this we've seen a, a slight dip in London showing that we've uh, actually seen more of a I guess a regional uplift in investment that's being made. Fintech here of course continues to be one of the top sectors in the UK um, and uh, it's interesting to note that the likes of health, energy, food, cyber security are within uh, this uh, top 10. They've crept up the rankings over the last few years. If you were to look five years ago, they certainly wouldn't have been there. Uh, and I think that's a very interesting uh, sort of reflection on actually what we're likely to see over the next um, few years when it comes to uh, investment. And obviously that matters in terms of the labor market. Investment for many of these companies is used in order to fuel um, continued scaling growth. And for many companies, that looks like investing in people. We've seen, uh, I guess, very much a sense of resilience over the course of the last year um, in terms of early stage and scale up investment. Um, we've seen higher totals um, than any other year than 2019 in that sort of early stage investment. Uh, that's an extremely positive thing. Um, it's not just been about the massive um, high level deals um, that have boosted the UK's total. Actually, uh, that sort of foundation of investment in early stage companies, making sure the pipeline of companies is is really coming through is still there. Uh, and that's a very positive sign. Um, and we've actually seen uh, a real boost in Series C rounds. So uh, they really have been the ones that have, uh, I guess, pushed things up. 2019 was an unusual year. There were some quite anomalous investments there. Um, but you can see that Series C has increased. Um, the mega rounds uh, at between sort of 100 and 250 million plus are slightly lower. If anything, um, that gives us a sense that uh, investors are really putting their money into companies at that slightly earlier stage. And if anything, I would argue that that's a positive thing, really, again, pushing that pipeline of companies through that are likely to achieve profound value in the next five years. So what does this mean? Um, and it's all well and good talking about investment uh, as a sort of a measure in its own right. But actually, the way that we think about it is the impact that that investment has on the ecosystem more, more broadly. Uh, and obviously we're talking here about new collar jobs, the new types of jobs that are likely to be created uh, and what that means. Um, the fact that these jobs sit at sort of the interface between tech, creativity, um, and uh, I guess that sort of sense of emergence of these jobs uh, is, is, is certainly reflected in the data that we receive from the likes of Adzuna, where we can look at uh, really current demand profiles for different roles in different geographies. So in the Southeast, um, we can see that there have been uh, a huge number of jobs advertised um, in the likes of uh, tech, uh, as well as healthcare and nursing. That makes absolute sense, of course, over the last year where we've seen uh, a very consistent um, sense of demand for healthcare and nursing. Um, tech dropped off actually quite significantly, um, as you could imagine, in uh, March, April last year, but since then it's seen a very positive uptick and I'm going to show you um, the sort of regional breakdown for that in a moment. For the UK as a whole, that's looked like a 36% uptick since August last year and uh, a return back to the sort of 90,000 plus roles advertised um, per week uh, compared to, uh, I guess at the low point, more like 40,000. So we saw about 
um, a halving of that. But 90,000 isn't reflective of uh, the sort of normal levels that we saw in 2019, uh, and I'll show you that in a second. When we look at the Southeast labor market, um, we can see that uh, there are uh, real benefits, I guess, of um, occupations in uh, digital tech roles. Um, the average advertised salary is significantly higher. Solutions architects, um, very prevalent in the region, and data scientists uh, are uh, one of the most highly paid um, technical roles within the region. Uh, in addition to that, we've seen huge demand for software developers, and that's the case pretty much across every UK region, being the most advertised for digital tech role. Um, and uh, in um, the, the southeast, certainly in some clusters, um, Python developers and very specific um, sort of programming languages are being demanded, uh, reflective of, I guess, the industrial makeup of those clusters. But it's important to say that it's not just about those technical roles within the tech ecosystem. It's very much uh, a, a sort of a, a holistic picture um, about uh, all potential jobs in the digital tech economy. Uh, and in thinking about new collar jobs, we're not just thinking about uh, coders and developers and people that are going to be those sort of uh, technical professionals. We're also thinking about the ways in which um, marketeers, HR, um, sales, all of those other professionals really work within the context of a tech business. Uh, and that gives us that sense that tech is open and it's open to people um, from a range of different backgrounds. Uh, so in thinking about new collar jobs, again, I'd urge us to think very laterally about the opportunities that are available right across the board. And apologies for the, the those things keep pinging up. I thought I'd, thought I'd muted that. Um, and then this is that sense of, uh, I guess, what normal looks like and and what it takes to get back to that sense of normal. You can see here in this dark um, black line or the thick black line, um, the southeast of England here, um, and the profile of demand for digital tech jobs um, across the UK and across UK regions. You can see here, as I mentioned, there was a significant drop off um, from March uh, to May, and that sort of continued through July, though plateaued slightly, and we've seen a bit of an uptick. Across the board, as I mentioned, we've seen quite a significant uplift, far more so than we've seen in other sectors like financial services, legal, certainly the likes of manufacturing and construction. We've not seen that uptick um, that we've seen in digital tech, and I think that will be unsurprising to many of us. Um, but it will take uh, a significant while for us to get back to that sense of normal. And by normal here, obviously, we're referring to those first few weeks of 2019 and, uh, and uh, 2020, rather, and the late uh, 2019. So this gives you sort of that broad UK picture. It gives you a sense of how demand has changed and, of course, how, uh, I guess, digital tech is playing a pivotal role within many ecosystems, not least um, in the Southeast. Uh, and it would be great to talk with you about what that means. We're at the moment as Tech Nation hosting a number of round tables with the Digital Economy Council. Um, we've hosted uh, in the Southeast um, and talking about, uh, I guess, what learnings can be transferred from different regions in the UK and from different clusters in order to make sure that we are fit for the future. And I really look forward to having that discussion with you uh, in just a moment. So thank you very much for your time this morning. I don't want to take too much time, obviously, given uh, the slight delay that we had, um, but look forward to answering any questions and talking through with you more about what this new collar jobs picture looks like in the UK in due course. So thank you. Thank you ever so much, George. Um, that was really helpful in terms of setting up the discussion. And um, as I say, without taking too much time from my part, I wanted to move straight into uh, Lizzie Hodgson, uh, her presentation today. So Lizzie is chair of the Regeneration 2031 steering group, um, amongst many other things, uh, things that I haven't really got time in a short introduction to really give um, life to, but um, I'm not going to do a disservice by trying to summarise uh, her incredible experience and expertise, but um, I'd like to introduce Lizzie Hodgson. Thank you. Thank you, um, and thank you for inviting me to participate today. Thank you, George and Jim. I'm really looking forward to the discussion and workshop later, um, but as I have quite a short time, I'm going to crack on. I'm going to take a slightly different approach to considering Kent and Medway's creative, cultural and digital future. For context, um, I have a particular focus on young people and technology in my work and my expertise. So with that in mind, I'm going to be taking a global view of young people's experiences and behaviours and apply that to the regional setting because 
things are changing rapidly and it's all driven by tech. I want to ignite some thoughts and ideas that we can explore later in the workshop, um, but I also need to give you some relevant background on who I'm referring to when I say young people, as this is relevant. So Generation Z, um, I'm sure you're all familiar with the term. These people are born between 1997 to 2010, give or take-ish. They are age 10, around 10 to 23. And the differentiators for this general to the millennials that came before them are, they don't remember 9-11. It's history to them. They're the first generation that have not experienced life before the advent of the internet and have widespread access to uh, digital technology at a very long, young age. Um, but this is important to remember. They're not necessarily totally digital literate. We imagine they are, but they're not. Um, they've also grown up with financial uncertainty with many witnessing and experiencing the, the uh, fallout of the 2008 global economic crash. And importantly, these people are now starting to come into the workforce. They're followed by a term that's, that's sort of coming around called Generation Alpha. There's an argument that this generation started in 2010. This is the year that the iPad was introduced and the Instagram was created. But for reasons I'll touch on later, they're probably going to be defined by the events of the past few years and especially 2020 and 2021. They're aged predominantly 10 and below. The reason they are, it's important to think about these people is because there's an estimated 2.5 million alphas are born every week in the world. And Generation Alpha is expected to reach 2 billion by 2025. Um, they're the first generation born entirely in 21st century, and they would on the whole be the most formally educated generation ever and the most technology supplied generation ever. But it's also understand, uh, important to understand the behaviours of both these cohorts, because it will define not only how we will work, but what we will work on and why. And I think it's really important to understand as we build out our cultural, creative and digital strategies. Generation Z tend to be self-aware, cautious but driven, self-reliant, persistent, resilient, empathetic, innovative, but global in their worldview. They are global. Generation Alpha are appearing to have strong values, believe in fairness and justice, are creative and also global. In addition, Generation Alpha, like Generation Z, um, devices are intelligent. Everything is connected and physical and the digital environments merge into one. But the difference with Generation Alpha and Generation Z is they're born into this. They know nothing else. But we're yet to understand this generation fully. What connects these two generations is they're both avid creators. While they might not be digitally literate, they're actually fluent um, in digital creativity. Generation Z, they use TikTok and Instagram posts as an example. These are creative, very, very creative um, generations. Generations alphas are streets ahead of their parents, mainly Gen, um, Gen X or the very, very oldest of the millennials. They engage with basic technology such as smartphones from birth. So the smartphone to them, it pacifies them, it connects them, it educates them, it empowers them, it engages them. And again, it enables them to create and work and function. So why does this matter when considering Kent and Medway's creative digital, cultural and digital future? Well, because the world these generations occupy is so starkly different from even the millennials that came before. So applying the same approaches or ideas might not work. Instead, we need to work with young people to ensure we're including them in the conversations and decisions because we actually need to learn from them. If we don't, the solutions we're gonna be building out will not resonate. And as Emma Scott, CEO of Beano Studio says, Generation Alpha is the generation that will seek to bend the digital world to their needs and ambitions ambitions and not be defined or consumed by it. So as older generations, we tend to focus on technology and digital as, we, as if it's shiny and new. But to these generations, technology is, this, is similar to how the light switches to us. It just is, it's part of the furniture. This is a mindset we need to adopt. Technology and digital solutions need to just be, and to adopt it, we need to learn from young people. But, um, and I know this is gonna be discussed a lot today, there are two issues that we have to take into account when considering these generations coming into the workforce, COVID-19 and Brexit. These are gonna be likely the, the dividing line, particularly in the UK with Brexit between Gen Z and forging the next generation, Generation Alpha, 
but the pandemic is going to impact on both of these generations. On a wider scale, I think we can say that um, 2020 and 2021 will be the definitive start of the new generation. But Generation Alpha will not remember the key events of the past few years, but they will be absolutely impacted by them. And all of the following will, in effect, be history to the majority of Generation Alpha. The pandemic, the start of the climate emergency, they're going to be living it. Political shifts, as the, 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 the kind of shifts that we've been seeing, certainly four years ago and in this present time. And then we have the technology shifts, artificial especially, they're not going to know any different. So this is going to have a seismic impact on the outlook of their their life, their work experience and their behaviours. And Kent needs to be prepared because it's not going to be long until a 10 year old is going to be in the workforce. The impact of COVID-19 from missing work and training opportunities are also going to be very important to consider. We're looking at perhaps one, one year, maybe even longer, of chaotic or unstructured education. And that's going to change things for many, many young people and businesses. So businesses and education establishments must ensure they reach young people through more innovative ways across Kent and Medway to make up for this. So, for example, what's the criteria going to be for hiring young people or on, onboarding new hires? Are we going to prepare to look beyond the grades that might not even reflect their true talent? Are we going to take into account the huge pressures, anxiety and isolation a whole generation of young people are experiencing as they navigate their way through terribly difficult territory with no guarantee that the world will adapt to their needs? The fallout could reverberate for years. So let's use this opportunity to reset the rules. Then we have the impact of Brexit. Now, funding opportunities for the cultural and digital industries are likely to take a hit. What will that mean for Kent and Medway? We're not sure yet, but we need to be prepared to move in a agile way. We need to empower more young people to access creative careers and nurture the right environments in Kent and Medway and be a place of destination, not a place where people leave um, or never reach their potential. It's going to take joined up thinking and effort. So we need to think collectively, how do we move forward? There will undoubtedly be reports and research on how lost unemployment and educational opportunities are going to impact on Kent's young people. But we, we can't wait for those things. We need to take a proactive mindset. We must tap into the talent and the expertise that exists in Kent already. We have 7,000 creative companies located in Kent. We need a joined up approach, perhaps a set of principles that agreed with educators, universities, employers and authorities, a collective mindset attitude and behavior that enables and ignites creative thinking and creative solutions to enable to ensure the creative digital and tech industries continue to thrive we want to establish kent and medway as one of the uk's trailblazers as we move into post-pandemic and post-brexit reality and i really do think it's all for the taking so with that in mind i want to give an example of one approach and draw on the work of regeneration 2031 of which i'm the chair for the steering group the premise of Regeneration 2031 is pretty simple. Every young person deserves the opportunity to showcase their true potential. It's part of a creative estuary aiming to transform 60 miles of Thames estuary across Kent and Essex into one of the most exciting cultural hubs in the world. The cultural and creative future of the Thames estuary should be shaped by the ambitions of its young people. We want to empower more young people to access creative careers and develop the skills they need to lead new commissions, produce events, create the jobs of the future and make the estuary a, cre a creative production hub. Now, in the case of Regeneration 2031, it's taking an innovative approach to developing the creative skills in, of young people aged 16 to 25 years, particularly in yet less advantaged areas of North Kent and South Essex and creating funded job placements for the under 25s within these creative industries that we know are here. We intend to champion the next generation of creative talent and future cultural leaders, leaders in the region by giving them new access to training, mentoring and importantly, aspirational opportunities. This is about opening the doors. This is about responding to the generation of young people that are going to be feeling quite desperate in many ways, as a result of what's happened over the past few years. And of course, employers play a role too. 
So Regeneration 2031 will help them create placements which best suit their business models, recognising that traditional apprenticeships are not always a good fit. This is an example of how we've got to think differently. And we're also going to provide funding and support wage costs of young people. So it's clear we need to be our own enablers and future makers. But we also need to understand that the rules and approaches that went before might not work going forward. And we need to let young people into the decision making process and be open to ideas. Thank you. That's all I have to say on it. I'm really looking forward to the workshop and I hope I've ignited some ideas or some conversational points there.